Painter Chuck Close famously said, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work. Most people think that finding inspiration is hard, but the truth is that having the stamina to keep showing up to make your art is harder. If you do that, the inspiration will come. Welcome to the Passionate Painter Podcast. I'm your host, Caroline Italia Carlson. Whether your art is a full-time career or your side gig, if you are passionate about creating art, this podcast is for you. Don't worry about taking notes. I'll do that for you. And you can find them at passionatepainterpodcast.com. Artist Mark Brueggemann works in printmaking, painting, drawing, and stained glass, with occasional forays into bronze casting. His current printmaking focus is a combination of letterpress and intaglio prints, further expanding his scope into the roles of publisher and illustrator. Mark earned his undergraduate degree in drawing and painting at the Art Institute of Chicago. He earned his graduate degree at Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville in drawing and fiber sculpture. During his career, Mark spent a total of 27 years teaching in the Department of Art and Design at the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. He has operated Atelier Vermeer Studio 2 since 1985. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm looking forward to this. It's a pleasure to speak with you more in depth about your work. I love the degree to which you've integrated meaning into your art. <laughs> Tell me about your background and how you got started as an artist and a teacher. My background was I knew when I was 12 what it was I wanted to do. I just knew it was going to be an art. And pretty much everything I did from that point on was to that direction. When I graduated from high school, I only applied to the Art Institute in Chicago because uh, I knew what I wanted to do. Once I was there, that's what I did. One of my favorite stories, if you don't mind a little uh, ancient anecdote. Al, please go ahead. Was um, my mother registering me for kindergarten. <laughs> uh, she took me up to Rosewood School, and uh, this lovely lady, uh, Miss Goomersheimer, handed me crayons and paper. And I sat down and drew the interior of the Three Bears house with a table, mugs of cocoa, and so on. And I'm listening to my mother talking to Miss Goomersheimer. And she says, well, he knows his letters and he knows his numbers and his colors. Uh, we can't get him to write his name. And I promptly picked up a crayon and signed the drawing. <laughs> so I think it was had to do with incentive and <laughs> knowing what I wanted to do. That's a terrific story. I actually dropped out of nursery school because I didn't like the cookies. <laughs> I know. And my mother, she loved to tell me that story about how strong-willed I am. And, well, you know, you dropped out of nursery school because of the cookies. And I said to her, you know what, Mom? I was four. You let me drop out of nursery school because of the cookies. Yep. Yep. Uh, so who are your biggest influences? Oh, um... Actually, at one, I was thinking about this for several days now. And, of course, I started off with Matisse. He Just the, uh, the quality of decoration in the work and all of those patterns and colors. And then the more I thought about this, the more I realized my greatest influences are artists I know, people that I've worked around and worked with. Well, like Kristen Teal King, uh, Kevin Brunette, Karen Heft, all of these people, I have been there while they were figuring out what it was they wanted to do. And it's that kind of excitement of being involved in the process that has broadened my vision, that has influenced me to look for more modes of expression that I find exciting. Yes, I'm, I'm excited to speak to some of those artists. Actually, I'll be speaking to Kristen this weekend, which is really a privilege to be able to uh, pick all of your brains about your techniques and your inspirations and, yeah. you know, just your, your daily habits in your craft 
And I see a lot of abstract expressionist in your musical works. Do you think that's any truth to that? Yes. I think that's certainly valid in that I feel music, this expression of virtual time, and then the artists in expressing it as virtual space, uh, somewhere the two have to meet because the content of music is so highly emotional. I think that painting has to strive a little bit to hit the levels of emotional quality in music. And I just chanced into Bach. He was uh, attending some Suzuki recitals. I had friends whose children were taking it, and I said, you know, I don't see how they play a fretless instrument. There's no markings, nothing to tell you where any of the notes are. And after the third or fourth concert, I said, you know, I think they, those instruments can actually be played. So I bought a cello and got a teacher, and um, that's when the cello suites inspired me, and I moved to that. I didn't think too much about the format, except that I had always liked the look of text put onto artwork. You would have a painting and there might be a word, uh, Friday, written in the corner or an assortment of letters. Then looking at the music, I thought, I have a whole other kind of text here. All of this musical notation is as readable as the English alphabet, or I guess the Phoenician alphabet. And it's like, huh, this can go in there. This can further inform the, okay, the splashes of color, the slashing lines, all of that other business carries the emotional quality of the work. And then you bring the text in, which gives it structure. And the shapes of the instruments give it structure. So it's always finding some way to use this chaos of emotion and put structure on it. Yes, I agree with you. And there's a lot of energy to your lines when you, your strokes and your lines carry that intensity of energy that definitely succeeds in that goal of translation. I think part of that is due to the fact that when I'm doing the drawing, the music is very active at the time. I mean, I'm listening to it either on repeated loop or I have a musician who's sitting in the studio playing for me. So that there were some works that I actually included the uh, musician. But for the most part, it was hearing the music over and over. And it's one thing I discovered when I did a body of work called The Dancer, Not the Dance which was based on dance imagery. And as preparation, I took years of ballet and uh, modern and jazz at the university from colleagues I worked with as I wanted to find out more about it before I started doing the work. Then the drawing was done with ballet dancers who would just keep rehearsing and they keep repeating the same thing over and over. And I'd capture a little bit of it each time the liveliness you see in the drawing markings comes from doing the drawing in a very active setting, whether it's the music going on or the dancers going across the room, or I even did a series on plays and seeing the actors in stage and in rehearsal. I like to draw most often from a subject matter in front of me, someone right there. I, I, used to say something living, and I guess the music is. At least it moves through time and space, so it's probably the same effect as having a human body there moving. Yeah, I would agree with that. It creates a kind of three-dimensionality virtually when you're putting something down in two dimensions, but you're listening to something that's auditory, and you're deriving your inspiration and translation from that. To me, that's creating another dimension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you about the cello music. I'm a huge sucker for cello. I spent four years studying cello. And for me, I think that music would be Dvorak. Uh -huh. And I always revel when I can hear the cello carrying some melody, especially because it's not often that the cello gets to take the stage 
with the melody. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm such a big fan of Raman Jwadi's scores from the Game of Thrones series, because it's all written for cello. Yeah. Uh, there was Dvorak in the New World. I had actually assigned that to a drawing class. Oh. Give me a visualization of the Dvorak here. I gave them all recordings of it wow. and copies of sheet music and said, okay, figure it out. But that was the thing. I was trying to get them to realize that drawing could be a living exercise as well. Yeah. You know, I, I, I doubt you're probably going to want to go there yourself, but I'm going to go there for you. You know, your work with the dancers and the music and bringing everything to life, it really is, um, it, it speaks to a strong influence, really, of Degas. Oh, yeah. I can see that. I can see it. Your work is incredible. Actually, I'll tell you who I feel most simpatico with is Lautrec. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see that. Oh, there is such grace and beauty in that stuff. Yes. The graphical beauty of his posters mm -hmm. and the combination of the written language and the, the visual language of art. Absolutely. I think that's one of the things I loved in Chicago was going to school. Every day I got to walk through the Birch Bartlett collection of the Impressionists and see the Latrex there. Yeah. And it was like, wow. Uh, this past summer... I had a trip to New York City and went to the Met, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art that is not the opera, but, you know, I had to go in and, and see mm -hmm. Lutrec and just all of it. I mean, at one point, I just was standing there and my children said, Mom, you're crying. <laughs> and I said, hush, Mommy's looking. <laughs> but I was crying. <laughs> yep. So your paintings and drawings do have a rich subtext, as we've said literally, as you've combined them with poetry. So is this something you've always done, or was it initially done as a prompt for your students' projects? Let's see. There was something about most poetry that I read, the, the depth of meaning put into each word, so that in class I was very insistent that marks carry more than just surface information, that it's going to give some impression of the emotional quality of the artist or the subject or the intensity or, I mean, otherwise, how would you look at the painting and say that Mark looks angry? I mean, technically, that's kind of ridiculous because the Mark isn't going to have any real emotional quality, but somehow you can make it carry the effect of emotion so that with the poetry and all of the words so heavily imbued with meaning, I saw the possibility of students being able to independently, individually, work on creating a unique expression of it. If you just stop and think of the nativities that were done during the Renaissance, I mean, there were rules. The Virgin had to wear a red dress. She had to have a blue cape. She could only be so tall Joseph could only be so tall in connection with her and so on. All these rules, and yet you had a myriad unique individual expressions of this whole idea. Well, the business with the poetry was for them to take the poem and internalize it so that it then became expressed through them visually somehow. I always got some elderly gorgeous results and some utterly mundane ones as well. I mean, that's just the way it goes. But after having done this a number of semesters and years, I was invited to be part of a monoprint workshop. And a friend of mine, Karen Haft, was riding my butt all the time about, you have to learn letterpress. You have to do books. You have to do books, Mark. Come on. You're going to do books. You just have to. And so finally I caved um, because I saw the possibility of doing what my students had done and how could I make this mine. And so I started with um, one poem that I often assigned, which was Leda and the Swan, because I wanted to impress on my students when they read it. I said, you've seen all of these paintings of Leda and the Swan. They are all seductions. Reed Yates 
It's not a seduction. It's a rape. Now, can you deal with this in your work? And that was the point, was that to make these broadside illustrations of poetry honest, make them refer back to the source that the, the author of the poem was talking about. Yes, well, I think that you've succeeded doing that in your own work. I've seen those poems you're referring to that you produced are very powerful. So how did you establish yourself with galleries? Well, um, I am not currently established with galleries. I did. I had up to 10 galleries or 12 at one time. Mm -hmm. uh, what did I do? I loaded my work in the car. And at the time, we were dealing with slides, 35 millimeter slides. And so tuck them all into slide sheets. I had already tried mailing off slide sheets to galleries. And usually after about three or four months, they would mail the slides back. Mm -hmm. And that would be the extent of our relationship. So I started loading the work into the car and taking the slides, walking into a gallery, showing them the sheet of slides. And they'd say, fine, can you leave these? And I'd say, yes, but I have some work in the car if you'd like to see it. Well, almost nobody said no. They always like, oh, sure, bring it in. I would say 80% of the time I got the gallery when I brought the work in. It was the presence of the work just meant so much more than the slides. Uh, one of my first galleries in Wisconsin was called Moyer Gallery in Green Bay. It was a relative, in fact, it was the opening show. I had taken my work over and shown it to Gisela Moyer, who was, uh, she was an artist who was running the gallery. And she said, well, we are going to have our initial show, our grand opening. And what she agreed to do, she said, I'll just take my work out of the show and put yours in. Wow. And that was my first regular gallery show, a regular commercial gallery. I've had quite a number of shows in community galleries, city galleries, there was uh, several in Escanaba, Wausau, around the area here. But the other galleries were all a whole lot of shoe leather, showing up, handing them the slides, and then trying to convince them to look at some actual work. I think that's a powerful advice, too. I think that's very good advice, telling our listeners to bring the work with you and see if you can't present something because it conveys so much more of the energy of the art when you hand it to them. Well, the gallery directors rightfully will acknowledge that looking at digital image is not the same effect as seeing the actual work. Right. But since they know that difference, you would think they could compensate for it. However, you never know how the actual work is going to impact another individual. It's all so much involved in individual vision yeah. that you just can't predict this stuff. And so you go take the chance. Here, look at this. Yeah, and that takes bravery, too, to pull out the actual piece because there's distance in presenting your slides emotionally anyway for you to mm -hmm. some degree. But when you hand them this piece of work, this is your baby, I think it's a lot more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But I also think that it does tear down that wall where the other things involved, the other elements of the physicality of the work, whether it's a small, precious piece or it's an expansive piece or it's got a lot of texture to it and the color is going to really come through more truly when it's physically there, those things can tip the scales. If, it, if you're going to need that tipping point, you need to bring it all. Yeah, I, I try to insist that students recognize scale is actually an important consideration yeah, and that it's going to affect the entire impact of the piece. That's very true. And I, th I do think that slides are the great equalizer for worse because it puts everybody into this little light box and mm -hmm. suddenly you start to get the road hypnosis. Um, I have a background in creative direction. And so I've spent hours and hours at the light box just looking at dozens and dozens of slides one after the other. And I would have to, you know, you feel like you have to cleanse your palate when you're tasting food. They're all incredible. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult to choose. But at some point, 
you know that you're probably missing some of the essence of these pieces that would really help you make these decisions if they were in front of you. Yeah, I have often seen slides of work that totally left me cold. And then I saw the work and I was like, oh my God. It, yeah. You know, it's just, and I've also seen ones that go, well, this looks nothing like the slide, <laughs> which right, made right. it. So it, it does cut both ways. Yeah, that is very interesting. And it, and it makes you wonder how much of the ethereal of the artist is imbued in their work when a piece leaves you feeling one way or another when you see it in person. Mm -hmm. Your story brings to mind a story I have from college. I was late to a presentation of our assignments, and they were supposed to be a self-portrait in black, white, and two complementary colors. That was it. It was a self-portrait. Mm -hmm. And I was working at home, and I happened to live about 110 miles from the university. I was going out to Stony Brook in New York, and I lived in Nassau County on Long Island. And it was pouring rain. And the work was done, and I was waiting for it to dry enough to bring it in. You know, I, I kept it home for a week, whatever it was. But I remember this, it was a life-size self-portrait on quarter-inch Luan, so it was just this thin wood panel. But I put a stand on the bottom so that it actually was freestanding. And I strapped this thing to the roof of my car, and it's pouring rain. Oh. I've got it wrapped in a tarp with bungee cords driving an hour and a half to the university and I leave it in the hallway and I take off the tarp and I went in to see my professor. And of course he says, you know, you're 45 minutes late and he's pissed. <laughs> like he sees me walk in with that empty hands. I'm soaking wet. And he says, did you even do the assignment? And I said, can you come out in the hallway? And he came out in the hallway and he saw this freestanding full-size self-portrait and his knees buckled and he sat on the floor laughing he just sat down and he said, you passed. <laughs> <laughs> so it made a difference. Mm -hmm. So how do you seek out opportunities then, like nowadays or nowadays versus back when you were in galleries? Um, I try to keep my ears open about just what are possibilities, what shows are out there. Uh, I've been entering more shows. I didn't used to. Well, at one time I entered competitions, and that can be pretty disheartening. Yeah. But then once I started doing some printmaking, you suddenly have multiple things, and you can do more things with them. And I was encouraged by Bob Erickson, who was teaching uh, printmaking here at the time. He had invited me to be part of a monoprint workshop which I swear is the gateway drug to printmaking, because if you start on that, you're going to be stuck in it forever. <laughs> so I did the series of two plate intaglios on the cello suites, and I was pleased with the way it looked and so on. And then I saw a call for entries at the Los Angeles Printmaking Society. I don't know what the hell. So I sent off slides of three of the pieces, and they got back to me. They would like all three of the pieces in the show. And I told Bob, and I said, you know what? He said, yeah, it's your printmaker now, Mark. This is the way it goes. Get used to it. And that work, different work that I've done in printmaking now have just been entering shows, been part of traveling shows. They're getting a very good reception from juried shows. The current one I sent off to Inspirations Plus it was at the Southampton Arts Center in Sag Harbor. And they had like 800 entries, international show. And I'm one of 70 that are in the show. And it's out of that same series of these uh, two plate intaglios. And it is, for me, kind of recognizing which shows it makes sense to enter. The other thing that I try and do is every year or two propose a solo show or a show with someone else at a gallery somewhere. Wow. I've done that a number of times in more local galleries. A friend of mine, Jeff Moran, always said you have to play at home too. So you always participate in your local galleries and so on. Whatever the show is, you just do it. And I think it's important that the people you see every day have some connection to this whole aspect of what's going on. 
So other than entering shows and occasionally writing proposals, like right now I haven't quite figured out how involved I want it to be, but I've decided to do a series of paintings on Bach's coffee cantata. It's one of two secular cantatas he wrote. And this one is essentially a comic opera, a very short one. And I would like to do it as a series of 10 paintings. But then I would like for some, probably university, to mount the coffee cantata, to set it up. It's usually sung not in costume or anything else. You know, it's like a a concert. And this is the way I like to roll, is to get other artists in other arts fields involved. I would love to have a soprano, a baritone, and a bass standing in my studio singing these parts while I draw and paint. I think it can be an exciting series. I do too. I think that's a wonderful idea. And am I correct that you decided that you weren't going to start painting cellos and incorporating them into your work until you taught yourself to play the cello? I can't say that I taught myself to play. I taught myself to practice a lot. (laughs) I really enjoyed practicing. And I had one recital. I will admit that. And it was okay. We did uh, Baccarini duets and uh, it was fun. But yeah, I had decided I loved the cello suites. And I thought, but I don't know anything at all about how a fretless instrument is played, what it feels like, anything else. So I bought a cello and got a cello teacher and took a number of years of cello lessons. And it was after about the first year I started on the paintings. I did a series of 10 paintings on the D major. Anyway, there was a first series of 10 paintings, which were layered paper, pastel, and liquid acrylic. Then a series of six oil paintings, um, the D minor, then a series of monoprints on the D minor, and then the G major for the two plate intaglios. Then I did a series of drawings, which were going to be lithographs. So there are six of those, but the lithograph process bested me. I struggled and struggled with it, and finally I realized I like the drawings well enough, so I just framed them. I haven't given up on litho because I love it, but I have historically, since I was a sophomore, had trouble getting a decent litho image. The last one that I did get was one of a, it was a floral. And after the fourth print was pulled, these lines started appearing, running through the image. I just, oh, the hell with it. Yeah. So, but, yeah, but the cello thing just has, Kept, I expected to get away from the cello suites, but then I also got this book by, um, it was called The Cello Suites, and he did a credible job writing this book. It's written in six chapters, one for each suite, and each chapter is divided into six parts, one about Casal's father finding the cello suites, one about him studying Casal's work with it, one about He decided he was going to, he bought a cello as well and found a teacher and started taking lessons just to write this book, his background. And he learned to play, though. I'm a little bit jealous about that. Then there were six different series in the books in each chapter, and they would be different aspects of, oh, one was the history of Bach and the cello suites and so on. It was a beautifully structured book. And it went into the kind of depth I wanted to see in the paintings, that kind of thoughtful arrangement of information. Yes, and you carried that right through yourself, the same way that you wanted to have the ballet dancers practicing while you were working on their images. Mm -hmm. You turned around and learned to play the instrument that you wanted to represent in your paintings and your prints, which really brings the whole thing to a 360-degree experience for you as well. And I think it probably conveys a lot of the emotion and intention in your work. Yes. I think one of the reasons that I'm in the field I am is because I like that kind of full immersion. Yeah. I saw it was possible to always just throw yourself wholly into something. Yeah. 
Well, with any luck, I'll be getting my own cello in the next year or so. I'm working on it myself. I, I'm determined to get back to playing. I miss it. Mm -hmm. Now, where did you learn the business end of the art world? Uh, let's see. I guess for the most part, I'm self-taught in that. It was like, okay, oh, originally pricing work, it was like, oh, I don't know. And we would just go with whatever seemed like the most I could get without them feeling cheated or me feeling cheated. And we worked on that for a while. Then, oh, it was at Moyer Gallery, where uh, after the initial opening mm -hmm. show, she offered me a solo show. And so when we put up the work, she called me up and said, can you come over? I really want to talk to you about some stuff. And we went in and she said, um, I had a client in, was really interested in this piece, but he wanted to know why it was $300 more than this one, which is the same size. And I said, you're absolutely right, Gilsla. We'll just start measuring everything. And so I decided to price them like uh, wallpaper, square foot. Okay. And it was it was arbitrary, but I thought, okay, uh, it's it simplified my life. All I had to do was measure, multiply. There we go. And I did that pretty consistently the whole time. Then. Yeah. That's how I ended up pricing my stained glass work. Everything just yeah. go with how big it is. That's interesting because I know different artists have different methods. Some of them do the square foot. Some do linear. Mm-hmm. Linear foot can be more, um, there can be less of a jump between one size and another. So they sometimes feel that that is more comfortable for them. Maria Brophy has a fabulous book called Art, Money, and Success. Oh, yeah. I'll be speaking to her in January. And she has a formula in her book on how to price. And I'm just starting to dig into that as an alternative to the linear foot. So it is interesting because... I used to do what you do or what you used to do as well, which is kind of go a little bit on instinct of what do I feel is fair? Mm -hmm. Also factoring in what I feel that my buyer will feel is fair and that we're both getting the value for the work that I've put into this particular piece. What advice would you give to other artists? Hmm. Okay. If you want to know if your work's any good, you should look at it yourself. Most artists can tell. Some of them don't want to. That's very clear. But if you're not honest about what you're doing, it's not going to be rewarding enough to stick with in any sense. I feel good about my work. And anything that I'm willing to put out there has to feel to me like it's right. It's not engaged in tricks it's not engaged in cliche. I had some friends who said, well, the trick to doing this in a portrait, I'm going, I'm not interested in tricks, no matter what. No formulas. Right. And I may end up producing some work that looks similar, but, well, I'm looking now, I've got two paintings in this room, one of a woman sitting at a loom, and behind her is a large plant, a cleome, blooming and looming over her shoulder. The painting below it is a male nude with a cleome leaning over his reclining body. And it was just looking at the same image over and over, uh, which is not formula. I know that uh, I had one model came out, and every single time I had him come, one pose would have to be the same one from the time before. And so I settled on one pose, and we used that every single session so that I ended up with 40 or 50 of this one pose, just having to go back to it. And I can say that of the 40 drawings, at least 35 of them were fresh. There were only five that just kind of, eh, why do I bother? But... You have to feel like your work needs for you to do it. Yeah. Oh, my biggest advice for artists is if you want to know what to do next, look at your work. It'll tell you. And it will tell you in no uncertain terms. Wow. So many artists feel they can't do that. They feel they don't trust their own eyes enough to believe that. 
I, you know, and I don't know how a person can go in the field if they don't trust themselves to see, to be able to look at something and now visualize it in this other form in two dimensions or a sculptural thing or whatever. But it is my vision that drives me. I mean, I keep seeing, I want to see this thing. I want to see it. That's a real important factor. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Uh, and I, I, I think in the absence, if someone's not quite there yet, where they feel that they trust that they will know what to do next, two other things would probably be advised, which one of them, of course, would be to get a mentor, someone like yourself, having an instructor of some sort that you trust. Yes. And perhaps if you feel you don't necessarily need a mentor, to commune with other artists and maybe paint together in studios or gather even for shows where you're communicating back and forth about the work you're preparing, that there's value in that, in the bolstering of your abilities to trust your judgment. Oh, I do have to credit the community of artists I've worked with, yeah. with keeping me going. We look at each other's work and we go, okay, now, but what are you going to do with this? Oh, okay. We explore the ideas together. We explore techniques, right. other approaches. What happens if you turn around and decide to do this in three dimensions now? I mean, it's mentors, especially if you're really trying to find your way. But other than that, I don't see how people do it without a community. I agree. I agree. I think it's vital. Now, do you have a set routine that keeps you consistently producing your art, or do you find that not to be at all a problem? Actually, it is lately becoming a problem. I'm having trouble finding enough time to work. I have a lot of other obligations that have come up recently that I have to answer to. But for me, the thing was to go to the studio every day, even if I don't do anything. If I go there and keep moving stuff around, okay, at least I'm looking at all the stuff that's there. Once... I actually get to work on something. It's very hard to tear me away. And I am really kind of fast at doing it. I've got, um, I've learned how to be very efficient in how to put something together and uh, make it, design it, and so on. Yeah. I needed that because I've always had a whole lot of exterior commitments. Now, one thing, when I was more or less starting, let's see, we had our children. I'm married. I have two children. And my son, the younger one, was born when I was a sophomore. So they've always been here. And people said, well, how do you manage to do this work with all of these people that really occupy you? And it didn't take me any time at all to realize that this was not an additional obligation. It was a support system. Yes. I had all of this support, people who believed in me, who looked at me to do something. So I think it really will depend on the person looking at the situation they have and how can you make it a constructive situation for your work. Yeah, I think you're right about that. I've, I've discovered, you know, my husband and I have moved several times in the course of each of our careers. I've been all over the country and had different kinds of studios as a result. So some of them were in basements, some of them were in attics, some of them were in garages. Mm -hmm. And come to realize that, of course, to consistently produce, you have to have a studio that's always ready for you. You have to be willing to take up space. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I came to realize once I had my children, and there are a lot of pets, <laughs> is that I don't produce well when I'm sequestered away. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, okay, the next house we get, we have to have a room, a dedicated room above the garage or out in the backyard, a she shed or something that's weatherized that I can go to. But I came to realize I needed my studio to be fairly close to my family in order to feel like I was still near them, even though I wanted to create. Mm -hmm. And that that was part of my creative lifeblood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if I hadn't found this studio a block and a half from the house, yeah. I would probably still be using half the house for my studio. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I've moved my studio onto the ground floor of my house, so my kids come in and out. And mm -hmm. again, it depends on the individual. I, I don't mind painting while someone's standing beside me, but I, I like it when my kids come in and say, oh, what are you working on? And mm -hmm. for me, that's part of the fulfillment of being able to be near my people. Well, your art is giving shape to your life, and it's being shaped by your life as well. So that I've often told students, you're not choosing a career. You're choosing a way of life. Yes. And this is what's going to happen. That's right. Well, Mark, thank you so much for your time today. I'm so honored that you took the time to speak with me. Oh, Caroline, this has been a real pleasure. This is so great. Your scope of creative pursuits is truly inspiring. So I'm going to put your contact information and how people can find your atelier on the show notes so that people don't have to scroll it down while they're working out or mixing Italian meatballs or driving. But there'll be ways for people to see some of your work on the show notes and then get to get to see your work where you're at, whether it's on Facebook or I didn't see a website address, but I might have missed it. No, I have someone next Wednesday. They're supposed to start helping me design it. I have been so reluctant. I just couldn't figure it out. And I, thought, oh. I understand. You know what? When you get that, send it to me and I'll add it to your uh, profile on your show notes page because I want people to see what you create. It's phenomenal. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so very much, really, for your time. Thank you, Caroline. This wraps up my interview with artist Mark Brueggemann. You can find Mark's contact information in the show notes for episode six at passionatepainterpodcast.com. Join me next time for an interview with sculptor Kristen Tielke. And if you're enjoying this podcast, hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode. Until next time, go make something.